All right, I really need to comment on this article here. It's just disgusting. The uh, Telegraph, London Telegraph, I believe here. Pope Francis calls for Lord's Prayer to be altered as current wording suggests God is capable of leading people into temptation. All right. Uh, the prayer, the way it stands, is lead us not into, into temptation. It's just basically saying, deliver us from the devil. Don't let the devil tempt us. Don't let the devil mess with us. You know, don't allow the devil to come in. All right. God controls everything. You see, that's how the thing works. But this Satanist here, this, this Antichrist here, not the Antichrist yet, uh, yet but uh, this wicked man, I mean, it's all part of the, their, their plan to bring in the true Antichrist, is put this complete buffoon in as the current Pope, and then when the Antichrist shows up, he can come in and, as Jesus Christ, and he can say, I've returned for my church, you've made a mess of it, you leave. You know, and, and the Catholics go, oh, yeah, you know, <laughs> that's what they're planning. But uh, look at this, um, this is December the 8th today. Pope Francis has called on the Roman Catholic Church to alter the Lord's Prayer because he believes the current translation suggests God is capable of leading us into temptation. And said, Our Father, which is the best known prayer in Christianity, should be said using the phrasing adopted by French bishops, which reads as, quote, Do not let us enter into temptation. So they've already changed it. The French Catholics have already changed the Word of God. So, I mean, it really shouldn't come as much of a surprise because the Catholic Church does not hold Scripture... They don't hold it as the final authority. Whenever the church decides to overthrow scripture with divine tradition, they can do so. And they say, well, yes, but we'll keep the scriptures, but, you know, we're just, we have traditions as well. No, actually, they'll, they have their traditions, and they can change the very words of God itself whenever they feel like it. All right? And if you do the research, the new versions, the NIV, the ESV, NASV, all these, they go back to the Vatican. And the NIV in particular, I, I haven't checked into all the translation committee stuff of all the other ones, but the NIV in particular was done at the University of Salamanca, Spain's oldest Roman Catholic university. Part of the translation work was done there. I showed that in my Real Bible Version issue exposed. Proven fact. But let's continue here. The alternative wording used in France implies that it is through human fault that people are led to sin rather than by God. The pontiff made the suggestion during a televised interview on Wednesday evening in which he claimed that the traditional phrasing was not a good translation. Okay. I am the one who falls. It is not, it's not him pushing me into temptation to then see how I have fallen, he continued. A father doesn't do that. A father helps, father helps you to get up immediately. It's Satan who leads us into temptation. That's his department. Well, Pope Francis, I'm sure, knows Satan very, very well because he's one of his favorite servants. I'm going to get back to this thing here, too, in a minute. But um, The prayer is part of Christian liturgical culture and memorized from childhood by hundreds of millions of Catholics. The current wording is derived from the use of the Greek word, whatever that is, which is found in the original New Testament. They always put this, the original, leading people to think that you know anybody has access to the original autographs, and nobody does. All right. Uh, a tree is known by its fruit, Jesus said. Okay, and you can say the same thing about God's word. A translation is known by the fruit that it produces. And the King James Bible has, uh, as it says in the dedicatory to the thing in the very front. Let's see if I can find it real quick here. can't think if it's in the dedicatory or the train yeah the epistle dedicatory uh, so that if on the one side we shall be pr produced by popish persons at home or abroad you know and they talk about self-conceited brethren and it says about the this translation here which hath given such a blow unto that man of sin as will not be healed and this king james bible has done that more than any other bible ever in history okay and when they say that man of sin they mean the pope so that's why the Catholics have worked so hard with Protestants to bring out so many of these new versions. It's a fact. Look it up. Uh, again, the, um, the new, one of the newer ones, the Common English Bible, actually had open Jesuits sitting on the translation team along with Protestants. I have it in a video. Proved it from their website. 
But uh, uh, the Lord's Prayer has been updated several times in recent centuries with the Church of England's website containing both the traditional version and a contemporary one. They're all going to hell, all these people. They, they could care less. I'm going to show you why I say that here in a minute. It comes a month after Bible scholars announced they had produced the most accurate edition of the New Testament since it was first translated from Greek. Sure. At over a hundred years, they've been doing this. This is the most accurate translation ever. We have got the most accurate translation ever. Where's the uh, English Revised Version? The Revised Version of 1881. That was the most accurate in its day. I have one, but I had to search for years to find one. An original copy. Where's the Revised Version? Where's the American Standard Version? Oh, well, we have the New American Standard Version now. See, and each one is the most accurate. <laughs> They just keep lying to people. Throughout history, now look at this little clever trick that they do. Throughout history, new editions and translations of the Bible have been plagued with errors. They include the most infamous version, Robert Barker's King James Bible, published in 1611, which omitted the word not from the seventh commandment. Now, omitted is making it sound like it was done on purpose, like what Francis is doing. See, they, oh, it's, it's so funny. Every time that they bring out a new version, every time that they talk about we got the newest version, they always have to bring up the King James Bible. And then they'll say it's so archaic, it's just nobody even uses it anymore. Then why are you mentioning it in your article? They always have to go back to comparing to the King James Bible because it is the standard in the English world, the English-speaking world. Just cracks me up. And this whole thing, well, the word not was in there and it was omitted, you know, and things. Uh, no, when they were printing in 1611, they didn't have modern printing presses, okay? In terms of what we have today. Everything's all computerized and spell check and all the other, you know, stuff. They had to take all the letters and set them into a frame, you know, the typeset there. They had to set them in a frame. All the letters had to be set in there backwards, so yeah, the original 1611 printing, there were a few places where they, oh, nuts, we messed that up there and we'll have to go back and, you know, print it again. I mean, you try to set all the words of a, of a verse of scripture, each word, you know, in its correct place backwards and see how it goes for you. You know, <laughs> it's incredible. But look at this. They say they omitted the word, but then it says the mistake meant that the commandment read thou shalt commit adultery. So it was a mistake, but they omitted it. See, they're leading the reader to believe that the King James Bible has errors just like any other Bible has errors. <laughs> just just disgusting. Dirty, filthy, rotten, disgusting people. But let me just give a little verse here to just kick this devil. Uh, let me show you here real quickly. Um, 2 Peter chapter 3. Uh, it says here, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. They change it, in other words. As they do also the other scriptures. Now here we go. Unto their own destruction. This man is headed for hell. He is unlearned and unstable. He changes the very words of God whenever he feels like it. Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. All right, so the Pope was, you know, he's not saved, certainly not saved, but uh, he's guaranteed himself a place in hell for what he's doing. Show you one more place here where you can uh, look about the thing of a warning about perverting scripture, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5 and 6. Every word of God is pure. You don't mess with it. You don't say, well, it's actually should be, you know, and everything. No. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Yeah. 
Trying to think of one more here. I just thought of one. And here we go. I'll finish with this one. Proverbs 13, verse 13. Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed, but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. Francis despises the word, and he's going to be destroyed. Right there. His time is coming. He sealed his own fate there. And of course, that's what this whole thing is about, you see. He's doing such a rotten, horrible job, which is funny because how does that work out for you Catholics out there? You know, the gates of hell shall not prevail against Christ's church. They have. Oh, we have an Antichrist Pope in, in, in Rome. Then the gates of hell have prevailed against the Catholic Church. The devil has installed one of his people in there to rule the Catholic Church. That disqualifies it from being the church that Jesus Christ founded. Hmm. Let me just go over these real quick here. On free speech, he says, You cannot provoke. You cannot insult the faith of others. Elijah with the priests of Baal? Oh, hello. Jesus Christ saying to the Pharisees of his day, Your whited sepulchers? Much like Francis? Hypocrites? Generation of vipers? You cannot make fun of the faith of others. You know... Paul called his enemies evil beasts, slow bellies, you know. On gay priests, if someone is gay and he searches for the Lord and has goodwill, who am I to judge? Isn't that funny? It just sounds just like lost people. Who are you to judge? Oh, I can't judge. And stuff. He's the Pope. He's supposed to be God's man on earth. What do you mean you can't judge? You know, he's a sodomite himself. You're never going to get to the position of Pope if you're not a sodomite and done some real sick stuff. Guarantee it. On the environment, it says here, quote, The earth, our home, is beginning to look more and more like an immense pile of filth. Yet, whose fault is that? All right? You look at who owns the big companies and stuff like this. Knights of Malta, Knights of Columbus. On misogyny, the fact is that women... Woman was taken from a rib, laughs loudly. I'm joking. That was a joke. Whatever. On birth control, some think that in order to be good Catholics, we have to be like rabbits. No, we need responsible paternity. Well, that's what not what Catholic you know doctrine says. So again, he's stabbing his own system in the back. Uh, on frugality, it hurts my heart when I see a priest with the latest model car. If you like the fancy one, just think how about how many children are dying of hunger. Yeah, sure. You know, this from the Pope that sits in his immense palaces and things like this, marble floors and gold things and precious stones everywhere, and don't buy a fancy car. Yeah, on sexual orientation. Every person, regardless of sexual orientation, ought to be respected in his or her dignity and treated with consideration. In other words, talk to them sweetly so it makes a nice way for them to go to hell. Yeah. On imperfect Catholics, no one can, can be condemned forever. Huh? Because that is not the logic of the gospel. Oh, logic of the gospel. Here I am not speaking only of the divorced and remarried, but of everyone in whatever situation they find themselves. So for, again, the Catholics out there, he's not even willing to condemn heretics. People that are atheists, that hate Jesus Christ, that hate Christianity and whatever, hate the Bible. They're not condemned. Here's the story. Okay, They are using this man to prepare the way for the Antichrist. I really believe the next guy in is going to be the Antichrist. The man of sin, book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 13 specifically. I really, really, truly believe that. They're playing, this is a psychological operation tactic where you have what they call good cop, bad cop. You have a guy that plays the bad cop, and then you have the good guy come along, and he overthrows the bad guy, and people fall in love with the good guy then. And behind the scenes, the good cop, bad cop are both working together. They're both friends. Okay? It's an old, old, old tactic. It's been used by the Jesuits and others for a long time. And they're going to use it again. How does that make you feel as a Catholic? I mean, the fact that you're the head of your church right now is a Satanist and saying things that are totally blasphemous. Uh, the gates of hell won't prevail against Christ's church. But they have. 
You better think about that. 